All right. Um, let's go on page 81 when we are finished. We are going to talk about trapezoids and kites today. Okay, trapezoids and kites. Remember we talked the other day that a kite really is a geometric figure, right? It's not just something that you can go fly on a windy day. Um, so our definition, a kite is a quadrilateral with exactly two pair of congruent consecutive sides. Congruent consecutive sides. Now, that word exactly, like a lot, like any time it's in there, it's important. If it wasn't important, we wouldn't bother putting it in there. If I draw a rhombus, just like this, based off the whistling, then does a rhombus have two pair, stop it, two pair of congruent consecutive sides? Does it have two pair of congruent consecutive sides? Yes. Does it have more than two pair? Yes. Because I could have these two right here, these two being one pair, two pairs, and then one pair, two pair, right? So the, a rhombus is not a kite, okay? They're totally different. They live in totally different categories. So th because this says exactly two pair, this does not have exactly two pair of congruent consecutive sides, but it does if it is a kite. So if that's true, then the opposite sides cannot be congruent, and it cannot be a parallelogram. Yes, sir? Consecutive is like one right after another. So if you were absent for three consecutive days, you'd be absent like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If you were just absent three days, it might be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but one right after another. So in a figure like this, these would be the opposite sides. The consecutive sides would be the next ones over. Okay. There you go, four consecutive years. Well, and you don't have to say four consecutive years in a row. It's either four consecutive years or four years in a row. I mean the same thing. All right. Does that help? All right, so a kite cannot be a parallelogram. They live in two totally different categories. A rhombus is a parallelogram. A rhombus and a kite, although they, can't, they may look similar to you, they are not the same thing and they cannot be the same thing. All right, so then we have these theorems, right, that tell us things about our kites. And the theorems give us the properties, and the properties of a kite are the same properties you would have to use if you were going to go build a kite. You're out in the woods, you had some sticks and some material or whatever, and you're just going to go build your own kite. you got to make sure that you have these things, okay? So if a quadrilateral, notice it doesn't say parallelogram or anything, it's a quadrilateral, is a kite, then its diagonals are perpendicular. Diagonals are perpendicular, so if it is a kite, then the diagonals are perpendicular. And so our conclusion that we draw here then, stop the humming please, is that line segment BD is perpendicular to line segment AC. And because they are perpendicular, we get four little what kind of triangles in there? right triangles. There's four little right triangles in there, and um, that can become important to us in a minute as well. All right, we good? All right, so then if a quadrilateral is a kite, then exactly, right, so quadrilateral is a kite, then exactly one pair of opposite angles are congruent, and it is exactly one pair. You can't have both pair of opposite angles congruent because if I have a quadrilateral with both pair of opposite angles congruent, that means that it is a what? A parallelogram. That's one way to prove that something is a parallelogram. And a kite, not a parallelogram. Okay, they will never overlap in their uh, what they are. Okay, so if it is a kite, okay, then we have exactly one pair opposite angles congruent. And this actually leads us to some other things. These are the only two theorems we have, but there are other things that are happening here that are important to recognize. That 
it's not like we need a theorem to tell us. We didn't even necessarily need a theorem to tell us everything that theorems tell us because we, when we know things about other pieces like triangles and whatnot, we can come up with that stuff. So if I draw in this diagonal, AC, that diagonal divides the kite into two triangles. Are those two triangles congruent? Yes. By what? Side angle side. Okay, you could even maybe use side, 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 right? Since it's, I mean, there's options there. Okay, so we've got two congruent triangles. So that's important here because, yes, these two angles here are congruent to each other, and that's actually our conclusion here. Let me go ahead and write the conclusion. Angle B is congruent to angle D. But then because that's true, we end up with these two congruent triangles, which means that obviously the angles that, they, that, that are this corresponding in the two triangles have to be congruent to each other as well, right? which would mean that this triangle, I'm sorry, that angle is congruent to that angle. You see the symmetry in the kite? And then this angle is congruent to this angle. So that diagonal right there bisects the, uh, that pair of opposite angles. Both pair of opposite angles do not get bisected, just one of them. You've got one pair of opposite angles that are congruent. The other pair get bisected. Does that make sense to you? And if you draw in just you know, like one of the diagonals, or maybe they're already drawn in there for you, you can usually tell, you know, from the congruent pieces. Not always by the way it looks, because sometimes, because they're usually drawn sort of to scale, but um, sometimes they're drawn in a weird way where it may not be real obvious. So you got to make sure that you understand how that works together. We good with that? Plus, here we have, so we have this, this is the, they're turned the same way, right? So these are the two triangles here that we're looking at right here. And these are those congruent angles. But then the diagonals do not bisect each other because if it did, then that would mean it's a parallelogram, right? But just like everything else for the kite, instead of having two of everything like we do in a parallelogram, like both pair of opposite angles or both pair of opposite sides or whatever, you just have one pair of everything. So the diagonals don't bisect each other, but one of them does get bisected. This diagonal right here bisects the angles and it bisects the other diagonal. Okay, does that make sense to you? So it bisects the, that one diagonal does all the bisecting, basically. Okay. We're good with that? And again, that's, that's not a theorem in anything. That's more just as you start labeling things and you understanding things with congruent triangles and how everything works, then um, you sh can, should be able to come up with those things. I just want to point them out. No, BD does not bisect anything. No. It doesn't bisect an angle. It doesn't bisect another diagonal. Nothing. It just it gets bisected and that's it. Okay. So it's kind of like it's one or the other. You either get bisected or you do the bisecting, but it's not going to be both like it might have been something else. Okay. Good question. Anything else? All right. And, okay. So let's, we're going to use the properties of the kite. So just like the other stuff, get stuck. It all comes back to you have to know what the properties are so that you can label things correctly. We are going to start by labeling what they tell us. I can't see that one. So let's do F, G, J, F, G, J. That's this. This is 57 degrees. And the other one I couldn't see. F, E, J, that is 25 degrees. And then I am looking for first the measure of angle G, F, J. G, F, J, which is this one. We'll call that X. So, does x equal 57? No. Does it equal 25? No. How am I going to figure out what it is? Here we go. Okay. Okay, good. Because the diagonals are perpendicular. Okay, good. So I could add them up and set them equal to 180, or since it's a right triangle, can't I just add, make those tonight? Either way is fine, but that one's a little easier. So even though you may already know what the number is, you do have to set it up. Notice he didn't say, then you know the number is. He did a really good job, even though I know it probably really bothers him that he can't just say the number. Um, he said you've got to add them up and set them equal to 180, right? So, or whatever, however we're going to do. Let's just do 90. So X plus 57 equals 90. Remember, the, the process is important. You don't have to show that you actually subtract 57 from both sides and all that. But that setup, where did it come from? And then what do we get for the angle? 
Do it in pieces. 90 minus 50 is 40, and then 40 minus 7 gives you the 33. All right. Then we're going to look for JFE. So JFE, we'll call that one Y. All right. So is it 33? Are these congruent? No. Okay. So those two are not congruent. So I don't know what it is, but it's not 33. Um, but I have a triangle here, and I can treat it the same way. You agree with that? So we get y plus 25 equals 90. So let's measure the angle. 65. Then GHE, GHE is this whole angle right here, right, which we can call, call this whole thing Z. Now, I've got a couple of options here. Let's just look at what's going on, because you may choose one over the other, but I want to make sure you recognize what can happen in here. What is the measure of this angle? 57, 57. And then what's this one? 25, because these are the ones that get bisected. Now, one thing I could do is I could use this big triangle here, and I can use these two angles here and get this one. Does that make sense? Because I do have that big triangle, and that works. I don't know that most of you would have gone down that road because you're looking at the little ones. One's not better than the other. It's really just what you recognize. And there may be times where you need to recognize that as a big triangle. Um, but then I, I do know, though, what's this measure right here? Y. This is whatever Y is, which is 65, and this is X. Right? So since I already know these, I don't have to go a different route. I know that Z is equal to y plus x, right? Which, it, and if I was, like, if, let's say I was storing stuff on the calculator, which clearly I don't need to do here, but if it was a different type of thing, then literally in my calculator I might be able to type that in. But this is just 65 plus 33. So what does that give me? 98. So the process there, super easy, right? But if you don't know the properties, you don't know that you have right angles and other things, you don't even know that you can do those as equal things. Okay, we good? Any questions? All right. So now let's talk about trapezoids. Whew. All right, so for some reason, identifying a trapezoid as a trapezoid seems to be a very challenging um, thing for some people, um, but they're, they're not going away. They're important all the way through calculus, all right? And if you can't even recognize that it's a trapezoid, you cannot do it, okay? And it's not even that it's that hard. You just have to know that that's what you have. Um, so what the definition is, a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of opposite parallel sides. That's not the best way to say that, but that's how the, how the ones work. So. I would say opposite sides parallel, but it's fine. A trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of opposite parallel sides. That exactly is important because... If I draw a parallelogram, right, there's my parallelogram, then does my parallelogram have one pair of opposite sides parallel? Yes. Does it have exactly one pair? No. So again, that's why that word exactly is important. Because it, and that's why just proving that one pair of opposite sides is parallel is not enough to say that it's a parallelogram. Because it could be, but it also could be a trapezoid. So our trapezoids, I mean, this is just an example of a trapezoid here, might look like that. And for the most part now, I think I can get the word trapezoid out of all of you if it looks like that. But if I do this, then I know, then it's like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what that thing is. You know what the most common wrong answer is when I say what is that? Pentagon. I get it all the time. I don't understand it either. I don't know where the fifth side came from, but I take a trapezoid and turn it sideways and like it just blows your mind. But here's why that happens. Okay, it's not because you're stupid and you don't know what a trapezoid is, but my guess is would be that for m most likely up until this school year, every single trapezoid you have ever used or seen, I would be willing to bet always had the parallel sides horizontal. So it's not that, you know, you turn it like this, you, you probably never had a problem on a paper where it looked like that, or if you were dealing with a trapezoid, 
I don't know why, but they just don't turn them sideways. But this is how we're going to use them in calculus. And we'll, we'll actually look at what you do with them in calculus a little bit um, later on down the road uh, so that you can believe me, maybe. But, um, but you, you can have to recognize that it's chapter three. Yes. You'll take pre cal if you're a freshman right now, you'll take pre cal your junior year and your calculus. Or you could take stats. Or there's some other options. Um, there are there are some other options out there if you feel like calculus is not for you. That's not a decision that you need to make right now. But it is something that um, you want to have conversations with your teachers about each school year about what to do. Because there's not if you know, depending on what you want to be and where you go to college. There's not a whole lot of options because there's some things you really should do, but nobody can make you do. But you can always come back and ask me what you think, what I think maybe you should do and how, what you should do the next year and this and that because um, there are definitely other things out there and some of the things we're trying to push for. But no. All right. Oh, well, calculus, I would say, is probably, I would say, is the hardest one. Um, but there's two levels of calculus as well. And so you can make those those decisions too, you know. But, um, yeah. All right, so we've got, um, all right, so we can identify where, yeah, and we're talking about calculus here. And then I'm trying to make sure you can at least know what a trapezoid is, right? Isn't that a little bit ridiculous? OK. Um, but you know what? If you can't do this, we can't move on. Uh, all right. so. So things you should know about a parallel, uh, about a trapezoid. First of all, it's, it can never be a parallelogram. They live in two completely different worlds. But for a trapezoid, each of the parallel sides, what are the parallel side, sides called? Bases. Okay, so each one is called a base. And then you have base angles. Now, this picture is already labeled for you. So these two are a pair of base angles, and these two are a pair of base angles. So base angles of a trapezoid are two, here's that word again, consecutive angles, which means they're not the opposite angles, consecutive angles whose common side is a base. That's why they're called base angles. Yes, actually it is. But this is a pair, like this is, D and A are partners, and B and C are partners. So even though B and A are both base angles, this isn't a pair of base angles. Does that make sense? All right, so then we have, and then the other sides that aren't bases are called the legs. And if the legs are congruent, then the trapezoid is an isosceles trapezoid. It's like an isosceles triangle with its head cut off. Now, for any regular trapezoid, just a plain old trapezoid, not necessarily an isosceles trapezoid, the base angles, although this is a pair of base angles, they don't necessarily have anything special going on with themselves about the measurement, um, and neither does this pair. But these two angles here that share a common leg, what kind of angle pair is that? Same side interior. And because I got my parallel lines, so what do they have to be? Supplementary. So these two are a supplementary pair, and these two are a supplementary pair because they are same side interior angles. But they don't have a special name. I'm guessing they don't have a special name because we don't need to name them and refer them to them as anything because we should just know that they're same side interior angles. But I do think it's good to be able to talk about them as something, like we talk about those as base angles. So we're going to call them leg angles, but I'm putting it in print in little quotes because it's not really a real thing. But it should make sense. If two angles with a common base are called base angles, then the two angles that share the leg are the leg angles, right? So leg angles are always supplementary, and that's because they are same side interior angles. You just don't want to lose sight of that fact. You good with that? So here's some isosceles trapezoid theorems. This first one says, if a quadrilateral is an isosceles trapezoid, so we know it's an isosceles trapezoid, and this is how you mark it, the legs are congruent, you label them as congruent, um, then each pair of base angles are congruent. 
So just like an isosceles triangle, the base angles are congruent. Well, we have two pair of base angles here, and they both end up being congruent. Because if this continues on, this is an isosceles triangle, right? That would be my base angles of my isosceles triangle. When you chop the top of it off of it here and it's parallel to the base, you end up with two more, and since they're parallel, they're going to have to be the same. Okay, does that make sense? You good? All right, so to abbreviate this then, this is going to be, if it is an isosceles trapezoid, then both pair base angles can grow. So our conclusion here is that angle B is congruent to angle C, and angle A is congruent to angle D. Okay, any questions? It's I-S-O-S-C-E-L-E-S. -E -E the C comes after the S, but yes, there's a C in there. So then it says, if a trapezoid has, so this, this says if an isosceles trapezoid, this just says if a trapezoid. This is the last time I'm letting you go in this class. You better pee in a different class. All right. Um, in this picture right here, there's too much labeled. So uh, we're going to pretend like it's not actually labeled as an isosceles trapezoid because that really shouldn't be there. All right. Um, so if a trapezoid has one pair of congruent base angles, then the trapezoid is blank. All right. Um, the, this, so we have these base angles, right? And we know for any trapezoid, the leg angles are what? Supplementary. So these two are supplementary, and these two are supplementary. So then what would have to be true about B and C? They'd have to be congruent, right? And then if both pair of base angles are congruent, then it's going to have to be isosceles. But notice you don't have to prove that both pair are congruent. It just says one pair, because if one pair are congruent, the other pair have to be because of that relationship. Okay. So if a trapezoid has one pair of congruent base angles, then the trapezoid is isosceles. So if we have a trapezoid... One pair of congruent base angles, then it is isosceles. So my conclusion here then is that ABCD is an isosceles. Then this next theorem has the wording's a little bit different. So it says a trapezoid is isosceles, and then if and only if. Okay, so let's talk about that phrasing because we didn't spend a whole lot of time on the logic stuff with the converse and inverse contrapositive things. Um, so remember, we can have a conditional statement. It's an if-then statement, and then the converse is um, instead of if p then q, it's if q then p. Basically, we could read it backwards and it works, right? And we've had some theorems where we have a theorem, and then the next theorem is the converse of that. And basically, it was that theorem backwards. Now, these two are not directly converses of each other, um, because this talks about both pair being congruent, and this talks about one pair, so it's a little bit different. Um, but there are some where it's an exact converse. And so when you have a true statement and the converse is true as well, you can combine them into what's called a biconditional. Now, why some of them get combined and some of them don't, I don't know the answer to that. Because we've had theorems that have straight up converses and it could have easily been written as a biconditional. Don't really know why they're not. But this one is. And so if and only if means that it can be read both ways. And we'll talk about that as we get through this. But it says a trapezoid is isosceles if and only if its diagonals are congruent. Okay. So what that means, yes. Go what? Yeah. So I could say, um, if a trapezoid is isosceles, then the diagonals are congruent. Or if I have a trapezoid with congruent diagonals, then it's isosceles. But I don't have to say it in two separate statements because of that if and only if. Does that make sense to you? And really, all good definitions can be written as a biconditional statement.
That's why some things, when it, we can make a true statement about something, but it's not enough to be the definition because the converse wouldn't work. So if you can write it as a biconditional, then that's good. Uh, so let's abbreviate this, and then we'll look more at that. So if it's an isosceles trapezoid, then the diagonals are congruent. Now, if I write it this way, this is just a statement that says, if it's an isosceles trapezoid, then the diagonals are congruent. But to make it a biconditional so that it goes in both directions, this arrow points both ways like that. Okay? So that's part of that symbolic logic. And I think when we, talk, when we did talk about that a little bit, I told you that you can take a whole course in college, well, multiple courses, on symbolic logic. And that's not just, a, it's not a geometry thing. It's not even necessarily a math thing. Um, it's a notation thing that, you know, you can use in many different um, aspects of everything, uh, math and science, depending on what you're doing to be able to, you know, state things as you're going through experiments or whatever. But if I have this, um, if I know that this is um, an isosceles trapezoid, then line segment BD is congruent to AC. Now, what else has congruent diagonals? A rectangle, okay? So notice this doesn't say if a quadrilateral has congruent diagonals. It says if a trap, it would be a trapezoid, okay? So if it, if the um, diagonals are congruent in a trapezoid, it's going to make it isosceles. Just like the, uh, the one for rectangle doesn't say a quadrilateral with congruent diagonals. It says it's a parallelogram with congruent diagonals. So you have to make that distinction or it could be the other one. We good? Any questions? All right. Okay, so the next part. Um, if you notice, I haven't been making you write the theorems on this, but the, there are still very important parts to that. You have to know the theorems and understand them, because if you don't, then you don't even know what to do on the problems. Um, and you have to understand what you need to have written, like bare minimum, right? Even if you think it's stupid, remember your opinion doesn't matter and neither does mine, okay? And I was, uh, I'm not gonna give you back probably the whole um, final exam, but at some point I am gonna give you the free response part back and we're gonna look at it because Many, many, many of you should have gotten many, many, many more points than you did get, but you're stubborn or you don't listen or both, I don't know, um, because it's not like I haven't said it every single day all year long about what you have to write, like the bare minimum. You have to label things. You have to set things up. You can't just look at it and know the answer. If you do, that's great, but you're not showing anybody that you understand anything. All right, so this says, use the properties of isosceles trapezoids. So we're looking for the measure of angle Y. So we're looking for this angle right there. Okay, so does that, a is Y, angle Y congruent to angle W? No, because the opposite angles are not congruent, because if they were, then um, it might be a, it could possibly be a kite. If this is just one pair, if it's both, it could be a parallelogram. But what is Y congruent to? X, and that's only because it's isosceles, not just because it's a, tra uh, not just because it's a trapezoid. All right, um, and then how are these two angles related? Supplementary. So what is W congruent to? Z, okay? So W is congruent to Z. So I know then that this has to be 117, right? And then these two are related how? Supplementary. So can I just in my head subtract it from 180 and write my answer down? No. Or you're using this, and at the very least, you have to say something like Y plus 117 equals 180 then you don't have to show that you've actually subtracted or borrowed or anything, but that is like bare minimum. And then you can say that the measure of angle Y is equal to what? 60 degrees. Process is important. I labeled my picture. I set something up that was a an algebraic reasonable thing to go through, and that was it. You good? All right, so then B. The length of RT is 24.1. The length of QP is 9.6. I'm looking for PS, which is X. All right, so do the diagonals bisect each other? With a kite, one of them does. But if I have a quadrilateral where the diagonals bisect each other, what is that? A parallelogram. That's the way to prove you have a parallelogram, right? So is this a parallelogram? No. So do the diagonals bisect each other? No, they do not. Um, so I don't, at this point, I don't know what X is, but I know one thing it cannot be, and what is that? 
9.6. Like it is anything but 9.6 at this point. Um, even though these diagonals do not bisect each other, when it's an isosceles trapezoid, they do um, by, uh, they do cut each other like these two pieces would be congruent and these two pieces would be congruent, but they don't bisect each other. Yes, sir. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Well, yeah, because it did specifically say, that's a good, that's a good point. It does specifically say using properties of isosceles trapezoids, right? And the fact that the only thing that I could, um, and I really can't prove that it necessarily is here either. I don't have enough to prove that it's a parallelogram. I really don't have enough necessarily to prove that it's, to prove that it's a trapezoid right now. But um, because it says use tra isosceles trapezoids, that's how you know. That's a very good question because you're right. There's not enough information there to prove either way. Okay. Um, so what do you know about the diagonals of an isosceles trapezoid? They're congruent, which means that even though I know x is not equal 9.6. Yes. Parallel, yes, but it, I think what he's getting at is just because I didn't mark it doesn't mean that it's not true. And so um, it could be that RS is parallel to QT and it's just not labeled. No, 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 I'm sorry, but but maybe, but if RS is parallel to QT also, then it could be a parallelogram. Now, nobody's going to try and like be deceitful and tricky unless it's like obvious that you're having to determine that. But um, but that's, you know, just like, and just like those sides that are marked congruent. We know those are congruent. The other two, because we know it's a trapezoid, we know that they can't be. But if I didn't know that, then maybe they could be. Does that make sense to you? I think that's what he's getting at. All right, good. So, um, I okay, so x is not 9.6, but I can add x in 9.6, and what does it have to be equal to? 24.1. Because it's an isosceles trapezoid, which means it has congruent diagonals, right? So even though we're not writing that out, that's a thought you need to have, because if you can't get that far, then you don't even know how to set that up. So x plus 9.6 equals 24.1. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's think in terms of money. You got $24 and you subtract $9. How much do you have? 15. Okay, so we left off the point one. So now I really have 15.1, right? You got $15.10. You got to give me 60 cents. How much money you got left over? 14.50. So X is equal to 14.5, which is equal to the length of PS. There's other ways to reason through that, but at the same time, um, you, need, you need to find ways to think through things a little bit more easily. Some of you. Some of you have already kind of got that down, but um, some of us make things harder than they need to be. Okay, we good? Any questions? All right. So then we have the definition of a mid-segment. So a mid-segment of a trapezoid, we've talked about mid-segments of a triangle, but this is mid-segment of a trapezoid. It's the segment whose endpoints are the midpoints of the legs. Okay, so a midpoint of a triangle connects the midpoints of two sides. The midpoint of a trapezoid has to connect the midpoint of the legs. Now, in this picture right here, do I even have enough to think that it might be a trapezoid? No, but if I do this, and of course, unless they are asking you, what do you have information to prove, then we do, you are kind of assuming and allowed to assume that if that's all you have, that is a trapezoid and nobody's trying to trick you on anything. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So we've got, um, it says the mid-segment of a trapezoid, mid-segment of a trapezoid is parallel to each base. So I know the bases are parallel in a trapezoid. This is also parallel, so that all three parallel to each other. And its length, now in a triangle, the mid-segment is parallel to the third side and half its length. Well, I've got two bases here, not just one like I did in a triangle. So its length is half the sum of the lengths of the bases. Which means here that I've got two things that are going on. Line segment BC is parallel to XY 
which is parallel to AD. Right? So all three pieces end up being parallel. And what this says is the length of the mid-segment, which is XY, is equal to half of the sum of the bases, so the length of BC plus the length of AD. And in your mind, you don't, you, you know, what's, what you have kind of remembered, or I don't want to say memorized, but what you have learned in your mind is not that oh, well, XY would be half of AD, because those letters could be different, all right, in anything. But it's the mid-segment is equal to half of the two bases added together. And that's the way you want to set it up every single time, regardless of whether you're looking for the mid-segment or they give it to you. Okay, so let's look at this example down here. It says find the lengths using mid-segment. So we want to find the length of ST, so we'll put an X there. Now, I know that you can reason through this, like some of you may already have the number in your head. You're like, well, I multiplied this and subtracted here and did whatever. Those reasoning skills, like I said, I've said a lot, those are great. That doesn't help you any when you're having to show process, okay? They are still good things to have and they're important, but you have to show a process. So the idea of a mid-segment is that the length of the mid-segment, what's, what's the length of the mid-segment? 31. I mean, it could be a variable, but right here it's 31. So the length of the mid-segment is equal to half of the sum of the bases, which would be x plus 38. Does that make sense to you? That's your setup. And then what you do from there can vary. Now, I can distribute the one half, but do I have to? No. I can go ahead and take care of the one half before I distribute, because these this is two things here that are being multiplied together. So in order to get rid of this, I can divide. If I divide by both sides by one half, what's that really doing? Multiplying. So I'm going to multiply both sides by two. Okay, so over here I get 62. Over here I do not distribute the two, because these are two main things that are being multiplied, so those cancel out, and I get x plus 38. So then i got to subtract. So what's 62 minus 30? 32. And then 32 minus 8 is 24. Okay. So that means that the length of ST is 24. Okay. We good? Any questions at all?